for joining us again. My name is Felice Blake. I'm here from UC Santa Barbara. I'm very excited to be moderating this panel, which has been a couple years in the making. So I want to just introduce the speakers today, and then I'll allow them to, to take over. So first, we have with us Furat Abdulay, a spoken word artist, organizer, and translator. She is a founding member and former organizer of the Muslim Student Association at Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz. Uh, in her spoken word, she focuses on anti-colonial criticism concerning politics of memory while addressing issues of anti-black racism, sexism, and anti-Muslim racism. As a board member of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, she organized the first Black History Month in Mainz, her recent engagement was in coordinating and conducting the two-day conference of the UN Decade of Afri of, sorry, the UN Decade for People of African Descent in Frankfurt. She also works as a Somali language professional, and alongside her political work, she studies digital humanities with focus on decolonization, the decolonization of knowledge production. Also joining us is Dr. Eddie Bruce Jones. Deputy Dean of Birkbeck School of Law, where he is equivalent of Associate Professor of Law and Anthropology. He teaches courses on human rights, EU law and equality, law and literature. He's the author of Race in the Shadow of Law, State Violence in Contemporary Europe, which came out with Rutledge in 2016. And he's uh, also currently co-authoring Race and Law in Europe, Text, Cases and Materials, and if that weren't enough, he's also writing a second monograph, the pronunciation won't be great, uh, Kala Pani, uh, Law, Imagination, and Colonial Indenture. He serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of Immigration, Asylum, and Nationality Law, and the literary magazine, The Offing. Dr. S. A. Smythe, a poet, translator, and assistant professor of Black European Literary and Cultural Studies, Contemporary Mediterranean Studies, and black trans poetics here at UCLA. Smy's research is focused on literature and other cultural responses to racism, misogyny, colonialism, and other relational aspects of inequality and oppression between Europe, in particular Italy, East Africa, and the Mediterranean. Their first monograph is provisionally titled Where Blackness Meets the Sea on Crisis, Culture, and the Black Mediterranean. Smythe is also working on a collection of poetry titled Proclivity, which focuses on trans embodiment, emancipation, and their familial history of black migration between Jamaica, Britain, and Costa Rica. And last but not least, Dr. Vanessa Thompson, a so uh, sorry, assistant professor at the Institute of Sociology at Goethe University, Frankfurt, Germany. Her research and teaching are focused on black studies, critical racism studies, post- and decolonial feminist theories and methodologies, critical security studies, and transformative justice. Her book project, Black Spaces of Solidarity, Anti-Black Racism, Black Urban Activism, and the Struggle Beyond Recognition in Paris, explores forms of black urban activism against Republican and transnational articulations of abolitionist visions. Vanessa has published articles on the work of Fanon, black social movements in Germany and France, and racial gendered policing in Europe. She's also engage, or engaged in these fields as an activist and is an extraordinary scholar. So please join me in welcoming our panel. Um, thank you, um, please. I, it happened out of order. Um, okay. but uh, in, a, in a transnational way, um, because I wanted to um, introduce you first. Um, uh, thank you for introducing yourself, but to also say, um, yes, just to repeat, um, you know, an associate professor of English at UC Santa Barbara, specializing in 20th century African American literature, African American studies, critical analyses of gender and sexuality, um, also situated, as I am, in the fields of literature, cultural studies, black and gender studies, um, and I have to also shout out your work, Black Love, Black Hate, Intimate Antagonisms in African American Literature, which recently came out from Ohio um, State University Press, and so as we're thinking about transnational solidarity, um, Felice's work is really great thinking intra-racially and not speaking back or speaking at all um, to white folk. Um, so without further ado, thank you for your moderation.
Mm. So we go in order. Thank yeah. you. So much. Hello. As you heard, my name is Furat, and I wanted to um, thank um, you both for inviting me. It was a hard way to come to uh, the U.S. because uh, I had problems with a visa, although I have a German passport. I um, was held two hours here in the uh, airport, and that was mm. kind of mm, a form of policing, as you know, and um, even though the only reason for that was my linkage to Somalia also. So I think um, this is something that I wanted to mention before I um, start about um, giving short insights of my central moments in my political wor work at the university. And um, yes, I'm starting with um, the impulse, how I started with my political work and what kept me going on doing what I do. Before I started studying English, educational sciences and philosophy, I always imagined the university as a place where everyone would study universal knowledge from all over the world. And I was so wrong with this assumption. At the end of my first semester, there was this task. We had to write a reflection paper in educational sciences about what we learned, why we want to become teachers, and what we were expecting from our studies. I remember vividly the last words of my reflection paper where I was voicing my wish to study not only content from Western thought, in German, Abendland, but more about Oriental thought, in German, Morgenland. Today, I wouldn't use these terms as essentializing opposition, but reference to its to its imperial, hegemonic, and dichotomic construction. And today, I wouldn't be able to name it as a construction or wouldn't be here at this outstanding conference without my sisters Ismahan Wayah and Sabura Nachspart. They influenced my political views and academic history when I invited them to our university. It was my first big political event that I organized as a third person person of the Muslim Student Association in 2014. At that time, I didn't know how this e event would affect my life tremendously. The lecture was about Muslim women critique, activism and empowerment. Ismahan and Sabura introduced us to post-colonial studies, feminist theory and decolonization. Terms and ways of articulation which I never learned or heard in my studies of English, which consists of American and British studies, and philosophy. Their intervention was my intellectual impulse and marked the beginning of my ongoing journey. That was my first part. Formation. After this event, a group of other black and women of color with whom I worked with started to found the first People of Color Association at a German university, which I also joined. We had reading circles that we called, ironically, Ausländer Lesekreis, foreigner reading circle, because white Germans wouldn't consider us as Germans and view us as foreigners who were allegedly far from education and reading. We critiqued the Institute of Ethnology for continuing colonial narratives and their involvement in possessing not only colonial objects, but also possessing human remains of marginalized bodies. Our criticism was dismissed and we were told by a professor of ethnology not to name our group people of color. We continued with our work and started an initiative against a racist logo of a local company, which was also reported by the Huff Huffington Post, and we created a nationwide hashtag, Campus Racism, about experiences on, of racism on campus. Unfortunately, our group doesn't exist anymore due to political fights within and defamation from outside, aka white students. Nevertheless, each one of us continued working in other spaces. A former member and I founded a new reading circle only accessible for non-white people and those who don't ad identify as male. The lack of marginalized perspectives in the university led us to the necessity of self-organization, criticism towards hegemonic knowledge production, and led us to build a community. 
second part, uh, third part, struggle. I started to join university politics as a representative of the socialist leftist list, which led to violation and denigration of my political work. Before I got elected as a board member of the General Student Committee, I was interrogated like everyone else, but with specific questions like, was 9-11 an inside job? You know XYZ, she wrote an anti-Semitic prode, what do you think? Or, what is your position on the border politics of Israel? I never, I never forget these questions and remember them as it happened yesterday, even though it was three years ago. Later on, my anti-racist work was dismissed and other white members of the General Student Committee tried to impeach me, but before they could vote, we, res we, we resigned office. It is important to mention that I'm not the only marginalized person to be defamated. In the political scene of Germany, there are groups of white students, intellectuals, who want to destroy and hinder the political work of marginalized communities, specifically those who are positioned as black, queer and or Muslim. Additionally to the white det detractors, there is within the Muslim community an, an awareness of anti-Muslim racism, but no engagement or awareness of anti-black racism. Public Muslim intellectuals who are not black are speaking prominently about racism without an addressing anti-black racism. My Muslim siblings who identify as LGBTQI are also overlooked but keep continuing to organize themselves in safer spaces. So the struggle is real. Fourth part, resistance. So, at the level of my academic studies, there was this huge lack of ignorance of marginalized perspectives and, on the other side, a mobilization against political work by black and people of color. My strategy over the years was to organize events that encounter dominant and hegemonic narratives. Last year, I coordinated and condu conducted a two-day conference in the context of the UN Decade for People of Afri African Descent. The aim was to bring black communities all over Germany in conversation to formulate a paper with political claims. It was a great experience which showed me how ambivalent it was to demand our rights in a space that profits from our work without payment for the black communities who formulated the political claims. The name and the reputation of the UN should obviously be enough as a form of so social prestigious payment. Two years ago, I got elected as a board member in the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Rhineland-Palatine, which is a political educational institute linked to the leftist party in the parliament. It was again a white space with no understanding of black intersectional perspectives, but I had access to money, which I spent on organizing the first Black History Month, inviting black scholars, artists and activists from all over Germany. My term of office has recently ended and I managed to hand my position over to two persons who are positioned as, as black and queer. Morrison said, if you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. The resistance continues. And my last part, regeneration. Organizing became a form of resistance for me, but I got tired. I got tired of the same discussions where I was explaining, defining and defending basic notions of black intersection, liber liberation and Muslim realities. Organizing lectures and events in the public sphere took more time and energy than, than I expected. I decided to quit and make more space for my work as a spoken word artist, translator and decided to study another subject called Digital Humanities. Currently, I'm working on my master thesis and where I aim to explore the connection between knowledge production and the social networks in the context of canonicity and digital media from perspectives of decolonization. Choosing my battles became priority number one towards my own path of regeneration. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Fourat. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad you're doing the work that you do in whatever spaces you are in. And it, when I was studying in Germany, if I would have had a comrade like you, I think I would have had a much better time of it. So thank you for being here. Um, so I'm not European, and when I'm in Europe, I um, tend to always have to preface what I say with, uh, with a lot about my personal biography, and I think that is a part of what being black, for, for me particularly in Europe, is about. Um, so when I'm in front of a law class, I kind of talk about how I've lived in Europe for half of my life, but I'm still not European, and that helps to make the tensions and the, the productive connections between me and black people in Europe quite uh, relevant from the, from the get-go. We have different passports, we have different food cultures, we have different connections with our, with our um, history and our senses of identity, and that helps me to make the connection um, worth uh, or meaningful, um, rather than to assume a, a type of blackness uh, exists in Europe that I want to bring to it. And I think I'm always conscious of that, or I hope to be conscious and critical of that. Um, but, oh, is there a um, well, could we go to this slideshow? Sorry about that. I just have a couple of images. Um, the, the one thing that I think about when I think about, um, yeah, it's that one, thanks. When I think about what I, uh, what I expect or what I envision in terms of blackness and connection um, to blackness uh, in Europe is, is a type of communication around um, speaking to the dead. And what I mean by that is a connection with, with history and stories that we generate, that we describe, that we are in control of. And that's about ancestry, but not ancestry in terms only of kinship ancestry, but ancestry in terms of being transhistorical, of being in these different places at the same time. And when I saw the, um, the, the, the statue and the creation of the, the Queen Mary uh, earlier, it really resonated with how I understand my, um, my affinity to um, black connectivity in Europe, about having these moments of recognition and recognizing that we're in these different historical moments together at the same time, uh, maybe not in the same ways, and that's part of the discussion that I think is really productive. A friend of mine in the UK, um, a curator named Barbie Asante, she looks at black connectivity um, in the UK but also across Europe because she's in dialogue with, uh, with artists in other places like the Netherlands. And um, she asked us to come prepared to answer a question, what is black togetherness in Europe? And we all had different approaches to it, but for me, part of it was talking to the dead. This is my grandma and her, and her mother. And I'm really fortunate to have had stories from ancestors that I'm actually related to, but story, intergenerational stories in general um, among black folk in Europe and making those connections not only across uh, national borders but also and cultural cultural differences but across generations for me has been really um important food was another topic uh that we connected around but that was really important uh to me um tony am I gonna, yeah tony morrison um said all water has a perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was and for me, because I do work on, I also work on the history of slavery and indentureship uh, in British the British colonial era. And I look particularly uh, at the transition um, between slavery and indentureship. And the, the idea of water being not only a metaphor, so Kalapani means dark water or black water, and it's the term that a lot of South Asian indentured laborers gave to the Middle Passage um, and it connects also with very violent uh, caste um, uh, history in in a Hindu um, in the Hindu context. It's uh, it's for me also a way to think about the connections because of the violence of colonialism that we have when we have those moments of recognition uh, in Europe. So that's something that I'm I'm constantly working through theoretically. But the main part of my work is in law. So I'm in a law faculty. And a lot of what I do is look at policing violence and deaths in custody in different European settings, including the UK and predominantly in Germany, where I've done most of my, my work, both as a scholar writing about, um, writing about the deaths in custody that happen, particularly against people of color, 
and also as an activist. And some of that activist work has been legal work. And so Vanessa and I are actually on a committee together looking into the death, of cu death in custody of a man who died in 2005 named Uri Jello, and he died in a jail cell bound by his hands and ankles, and he was, uh, he was burned to death. And so we're looking into this trying to get a grasp of what actually happened versus what the, the state tells us happened. And of course, this work is being driven by activists. And for me, as a lawyer, I think when I think about my commitments, I think about blackness as an organizing principle of how I'm committed to this issue. Because of course, people, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be a black person to die in custody. And there are forms of racism that affect um, groups other than black people in, in Europe. I mean, that goes without saying. But the ways in which policing occurs against black people in Europe, I, there are specificities around that. And um, in the German context, um, there are parallel stories about um, policing deaths and policing violence. And as, um, uh, as you'll, you might hear later, the data isn't collected on who's killed and who's hurt in policing situations. But because of the work of activists and families and because of the, the conversations happening across Europe on these issues, we know that disproportionately um, black people are going to be at a higher risk of being hurt or killed by police when they're in those encounters. So being um, accountable to uh, black communities across Europe as someone who's functioning within uh, an oppressive legal system with racist intentions even built into some of those systems or um, a strategic limitation on the ability for black people to have a remedy under law in, in European contexts Germany, France, the Netherlands, um, the UK. It's, it's important for me to be able to act in a legal capacity, but have my eye on kind of a broader set of issues. Um, I'll explain this image in one moment. But the, the, the two of the writers, for example, who, who kind of um, illustrate this for me are Patricia Williams and Mari Matsuda, who in, in various ways have said, you know, we have to be able to breathe so there is, uh, there's, there's an important uh, goal that we have in pursuing rights-based approach to things. But as we know, the law is structured to, to help us fail in certain ways. The law is structured in order to circumvent maybe more structural issues of racism and violence. So it's about keeping your eye on the vision while trying to serve as a tool or a lever for communities who are trying to drive forward work. Um, so one of those communities, uh, I think, across Europe is, uh, can be thought of as a community of people having conversations about blackness. So a black community of sorts uh, that's doing that work in, in Europe. And so the, just to, to, to finish off with a couple comments, this is um, the trial, the Uri Jallo trial in the appeals process. And there are police in the room who are guarding kind of the, 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 the judges. There are our newspaper reporters Uri Jallo's mom is here, kind of with her head down, and uh, she died a little later um, during the process. Um, but this court is a, a, a circuitry of, um, and it reproduces the violence that's happened on the streets. And so as a lawyer, um, part, of, part of the productive work that I think that I can, I can offer in these types of discussions is uh, being a tool for, for those who are driving forward the real connections um, between black folk in different European contexts. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Fukat. Um, well timed. Um, and Eddie. Um, yeah, I will be um, really brief. I'm actually looking more forward to the, the, the broader conversation, but I will offer just, some, uh, just a few remarks. Um, and again, thanking everyone. So also, yeah, we, uh, Vanessa, we uh, put up some, I tell everyone to speak into the mic and now I understand the difficulty. P perspective shift, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, we had, uh, and the start, um, for this round table, we all had some questions um, to really think through. Um, um, also that Vanessa and others have, have been asking throughout the day in terms of um, the real sustained methodological 
um, sort of imperative, like the really taking seriously our positionality. Um, and so I also thank you, um, Forat, um, for that really moving intervention, just really grounded in um, uh, some black feminist epistemology um, and really, really embodied response, and also um, Eddie for your positionality statement. I'm really excited to think across um, the two of you, and of course also Vanessa, who follows um, you, Eddie, especially because you think about the legal framework, but also are deeply engaged in, in the poetic um, and the creative. Um, so, so first I'll speak, um, you know, I want to talk uh, more broadly um, and openly about um, the, the concept and the, the framing and then reframing of the black Mediterranean, um, but first to take a step back and really think about um, prior to this recent configuration that people have been naming, um, there were a lot of movements. I mean, we had yesterday, we did have um, Heather Marilyn Donald Carter speaking to us about um, uh, the work and the, the interventions that have been happening um, precisely since 1990, I think was the year that was named. Um, and so I wanted to just read um, just briefly uh, a little passage here. Um, uh, there have been significant debates on the issues of race and racism that have taken place in the Italian public sphere um, since the late 1990s and concertedly, um, with more increased attention being paid to racial discrimination in Italy. Um, scholars agree, and you know, I'm coming from, um, as was mentioned, a, a literary perspective, um, which I'm thinking expansively, um, but scholars of um, Italian literary production um, agree on the emergence of migration literature or literature of migration, which has dual meanings that we can talk about, as the response to both the killing of South African refugee, Jerry Maslow, um, in Villa Literno, which is north of Naples, um, in August of 1989, and then the first law um, following that regulated immigration, Act 39, known as the Martelli Law, um, which was enacted in 1990. As a response to this, we directly see a creative response, um, really a proliferation of, of this so-called um, literature of migration, or also letteratura quattro mani, which quattro mani is four hands, so the two hands of the writer, and then the two hands of a translator who was often, well, invariably a white European, but often um, French, if not Italian, or who spoke French, because a lot, um, as was mentioned yesterday, of the uh, migrants um, and refugees um, were, were from French-speaking nations. Um, uh, and so, um, yeah, I think we can also think about, when thinking again about transnational solidarities and, and engagements and thinking on blackness, like really, who really has the hands, who's really shaping the work and, and really whose voice is it, um, and how, have, how far we've come and how, how far we still have yet to go um, on this. Um, and so with the killing of Jerry Maslow, we really see um, a lot of, um, yeah, political actions and responses. But again, here I would also bring in um, yesterday's um, speakers who were talking about, um, I absolutely am blanking on it, the work is phenomenal, uh, Adia Trishla and Tonika Hunter, who were thinking with Series Black and thinking about um, in Vienna, I was really moved by this um, when they were saying that um, protests and getting permits and really in, engaging in this legal framework, it's difficult to, um, for some, especially those rendered non-citizen migrants, refugees, and those who move in solidarity with them to get permits to protest. However, and this is really interesting to me, it was a bit easier to get um, permits and licenses to enact performance spaces. And so we think about, um, yeah, the, the turn for me to the literary, the turn to thinking about the poetic um, is not merely, I say with inverted, with, with quotes, um, merely an aesthetic move, but also precisely an aesthetic move. Um, when we think about poetry, that's why that session itself was called, um, had, had poesis in the title, uh, not just the lofty term, but really etymologically thinking about poesis, which etymologically means like creating and fashioning and refashioning. So the move from a quattro mani, the move from needing a mediator to really speaking back and really speaking on one's own terms uh, and engaging in um, the radical, the black radical act of refashioning and reforming um, and also regenerating. Thank you Farad for bringing that, that, term, that term to the fore. Um, and so just to zoom out a bit, just to zoom out a bit, um, as, as parts of this um, session is on borderscapes, I really want to think about borderscapes um, in terms of, um, you know, I'll, I'll take my poetic license here and not just uh, in a geological or geographic space, right, but really the borders in this case of time. And what those of us um, socialize all are in part um, in or in relation to Europe, um, just as a shout out, that's all of us, right, because of the configuration of racial capitalism, but those specifically who have this, these embodied histories, um, 
when we think about the borders, I want to want to bring in Paul Gilroy, right, who talked to us about um, a specific kind of racism, namely anti-black racism, which is to render our presence um, in Europe as presentist, right, to say that we just arrived, to say that Africans arrived, and to give us a date. So as I read this thing on Jerry Maslow, if we can, as though we could say, well, he died in August, so 1989, that perhaps in July 1989 was the arrival of the African presence in Italy. And so really I'm working on um, trying to relate this back to the borderscape um, construct is really the temporality question to say not only have we always been, not only as many um, in Britain and broadly in Europe from the 80s and moving forward have said, you know, we are here because you are there, but rather we've always actually been here. We've always already been here um, and, and the relationship is actually not unidirectional. Um, so to really disrupt this temporality that says um, that actually um, sort of intellectually and, and politically immobilizes us to a certain degree so that such that we're always writing and speaking back so that we also have to take up the national mantle and say, but I've been here. I'm so Italian, I'm so Norwegian. I'm really just staring at people I see, you know, but you're not saying this, but I'm looking at your faces, right? I'm so Dutch. Okay, well then take it and let's move on, right? And let's also then think about what, what that means and, and what we can do with one another because what, what then of those who will never claim this and then what of those who never wish to you know, there's some um, in Italy, and I spent some time in Università di Bologna, University of Bologna, um, as a student myself, and and thinking about people who, yeah, were born and raised there, but you're like, in the in the black way of where are you from, right? Not as an indictment, but really like, where are people from? Let's talk, uh, and they're like, black. You know, here I am, and I'm so grateful again for this to be recorded. I'm junior faculty here, but you know, people ask where I'm from on a regular basis, and I've just taken to saying diaspora. It's a cheeky response, and it's a resistive response, but it also is, um, for me, a broader rendering of a commitment to where I am from, which is blackness, and a, and a political blackness, not in the nuanced and difficult uh, way that it's been taken up in, in Britain, for example, but really just to claim blackness and to claim where I am from and move forward um, beyond, again, a geographical border. Um, and so um, I think there I'm speaking a bit, which I'm happy to tease out about my real approaches to the black Mediterranean. There's a, a lot of scholarship, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, emerging on using this term and configuration and I, I sit with them and I read their scholarship um, and I'm also, and, and talk to them and engage um, uh, in their events, but I'm also very much thinking about um, um, you know, and thank you for citing Toni Morrison because I think then about her saying, thin love ain't love at all, right? And for me, I would like to, um, as I sort of begin to close, think about that in relation to the disciplinary, right? Uh, a lot of work broadly in black European studies, no shade to anyone, <laughs> but this is what it's been, is primarily sociological, anthropological. Why? Is it a way that we authorize our knowledge? Is if I just present to you a series of sonnets that a Ghanaian wrote, that an Italian wrote, that a Dutch, a black Dutch, right, an Afro-Turk wrote, that this is somehow not um, authorizing enough and speaking to material experiences? So for me, that's a, that, that, that engagement um, has for me felt um, thin in the way that I'm trying to think about what I'm beginning to call um, a non-binary approach to black studies, uh, a non-binary approach to the black Mediterranean, which is both to say, you know, the neither this nor that thing, but also the both and thing, right? So not moving in negation, but actually specifically in relation, in a Glissantian sense to say, um, both we need citizenship because we are dying here, but then also citizenship is not the response. I often tell my students or ask them, you know, do we want the state to love us or do we want to be free, right? And so for me, this is an understanding that all citizenship as we move towards it is all of it um, a white supremacist construction and it's all necessarily conditional. So as we strive for citizenship and move in alliance away from a state orientation, how do we actually then um, get free? How do we make those moves? Um, I'm out of time, but I look forward to talking a bit more about it. Yeah, um, thank you so, so much. I have a lot of thick love for you all on this panel. <laughs> and um, the way you think and the way you thrive and inspire me. Um, so in, in my short input, and I hope I can make it short, I'm actually still have to cut it while I'm going through it. Um, I, I want to talk about um, what I'm currently work, working on, but also the work I'm deeply 
um, invested in and engaged now since, since decades, actually, which is the policing of blackness in Europe and how it unfolds from the center to the shores and the sea. Um, excuse, pardon. Um, it's the second presentation, please. Um, and how black collective struggles in France, Germany, and Switzerland against policing are currently waged. And with a lot of these um, collectives, I work now since several years. In Germany, I've been a co-founder of two of the collectives. I will um, talk about it um, a, a bit later. Um, and being myself experiencing, but also engaging with the policing of blackness since, um, yeah, since I'm alive. So in these contexts, Germany, Switzerland and France, for example, the legal regulations do not explicitly operate with references to race, as you, um, I think, uh, know. But of course, institutional racism is perpetuated and fostered through the relation of racism and migration and mobility, meaning who is constructed as a stranger in relation to the citizen, crime terrorism, which bodies are attached to criminality and deviance and space, right? Which places are constructed as safe in relation to the bodies that inhab inhabit these spaces. And why Europe, and that means there I really have to like um, talk a bit about how I, like as a student of philosophy in Frankfurt, Goethe University, like which is often thought of as the birthplace of critical theory, Adorno, Horkheimer, etc. I had to engage with these theories a lot, especially the critical theories of policing to say, okay, there's a deep, deeply, there's going something deeply wrong here. Because in a lot of these um, theories, starting from Marx's writings on the Paris Commune, but also anarchist critiques of the police, Walter Benjamin critiques of violence, etc., but also Louis, Louis Althusser, the constitutive relationship between policing, racial capitalism, colonialism, and, and colonialism has actually been violently overlooked. And I try to, to think through that this has actually lead to two major pitfalls. The one is methodological Eurocentrism because they try to understand policing from the national framework. Now it is Gominda Bamra and others, of course, who have, um, who have taught us that um, European nation states were empires, first of all, before they be even became nation states, right? They became nation states through the process of historical formal decolonization. So what where does this lead us to when we think of the, poli of the police as, an, as a na national institution? And the second um, rea uh, really uh, speaks to the realm of subjectivation, something that Louis Althusser calls interpolation by describing um, um, a scene where he would say, well, you have a subject and that here's the police, hey, you there, and the subject turns around and is thereby involved by the logic of law and order and understands itself as a, as a modern rightful subject, meaning a subject that, that has rights. And this includes property rights. And here's where the black perspective comes in. Um, because I would question, could it be that the subject in Althusser also turns around because it can be relatively sure that it will not experience repressive force by the police? How about individuals and groups whose every day is actually impregnated by direct or indirect repressive control of police? So isn't it most likely that they will try to escape from the control? And here's a banner from... Um, from a manifestation in the struggle for justice for Theo Luaka and Adama Traore that is mainly waged in the urban black, brown and Muslim working class districts of France's outer cities. So Theo Luaka was brutally beaten and sexualized by French police on, this, on February 2017 and Adama Traore died in police custody in July 2016. So the claim Theo and Adama remind us why Ziad and Buna ran away actually speaks, and Ziad and Buna are the two youngsters also Jean Beeman yesterday talked about who were escaping from a racist police control into an a electricity house and were brutally elec electrocuted. So I'm actually engaging with the question, what do these lived experiences tell us not only about critical theories of policing, but what do they tell us about um, the relation of policing itself? Um, engaging with these relations and experiences, um, of course, has different modalities, so how do these experiences look like? Of course, there's the restriction of movement, bodies become borders themselves. There's the relation to the public in, in the case that police subjects are then further uh, cr uh, criminalized and recriminalized by hegemonic society. But it's also 
And here I am um, re reference to George Lipsitz, who, for example, wrote that policing takes time. It's also something that does not stop with the actual control, right? So the control goes beyond the actual control in terms of police subjects have to decriminalize themselves. And here for me, the thoughts of, of Rob Nixon on slow violence are particularly important. So a form of violence that actually extends the spectacular event in time and space. Now take a case um, around um, Wilson A, who was stopped and searched by the police on October 10th, 2009, in Zurich in a tram where he and his friends were actually coming from a meeting and they were asked by the police to, to show their identity cards. Wilson said why, he said actually you're only controlling us. He was aggressively pushed out of the tram and was then brutally beaten. Now Wilson told the police that he just had heart surgery but the police actually continued and insulted him even with racial slurs and Wilson ah, could barely breathe. Now breathing refers to the physical as well as the social breathing here. And I'm drawing on a Fanonian framework. Fanon, in his essays on dying colonialism, talks about combat breathing, the struggle to breathe um, in physical as well as social meta-realities. Think of Uri Jalo, <coughs> and Eddie just talked about Uri Jalo, who was burned alive in a police holding cell in Dessau and mostly died from an inhalative heat shock. So I'm trying to follow the, the motive and the materiality, it's not only metaphorical, of policing as the condition of unbreathing. Mm. Mm. Think of the refugee activist Sister Mimi, who was engaged in the refugee protest at the Oranienplatz and the Gerhard Hauptmann School in Berlin, and who died on December um, 11, 2014, in a school they squatted and they were actually surrounded by police. And Mimi often said that this kind of repression is taking her breath. Mm. But also inaction, right? The active inaction of police when they don't actually intervene, when black people are attacked by neo-Nazis um, or when they actually get missing, like the recent case of Rita Ovo Oyunga, who was missing since April 2019, um, who actually had to live in a lager, in a so-called refugee um, housing, and her friends were actually telling the police that she's missing and they haven't looked for her for two months. And then in the third month, they found her limbs spread in the forest almost 10 kilometers from the, the center she was actually um, yeah, hold. So here you see that's also the relation of, of active inaction that leads um, to death and the condition of unbreathing. But this is also, when I speak about slow violence here, I also would argue that it extends the body the policing is directed towards, right? So it becomes trans transgenerational. If we, for example, um, Eddie just mentioned the Uri Jalo's mother, Mariama Jambo Jalo, after she came to Germany a second time during the trial of her son, or around the death of her son, but um, actually died when she, came, when she went back to Sierra Leone. So here you, th you have a relation of how policing, the policing of blackness, actually goes beyond time and space, beyond the bodies it is directed um, towards. And this already shows that it's also a deeply intersectional phenomenon. So the death of Christy Schwundek, um, for example, who was shot in a job center because she actually um, refused to leave the center until she receives the 10 euros um, that was not transferred to her account. But this is resisted through various No, I, I, I would like to go back. Yes, no, one, yeah, exactly. So these, this condition is resisted continuously by various groups, and here it's important for me to say that these groups were organizing before something like Black Lives Matter was somehow traveling uh, to Europe, you know, especially from the intersection of people um, that are rendered non-citizens. Um, and there are various um, um, groups working on this and trying to interrogate and to and to, to build re resistance, starting from documenting these practices, which is extremely important in contexts where there are no racial, ethno, ethnic statistics, but also waging legal struggles, like Eddie talked about, the sensitization of the dominant society, like to really interpolate, especially also white leftist circles, to say like, okay, you need to intervene, but also the forms of Mem memory making as a form of staying connected to the death, 
right, connected in a continuous relationship. And these practices of memory making are often very fugitive. Um, street signs, writing names on the streets. Signs, no, you could leave it there, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to also talk about a bit about how these practices are actually um, struggled against. And it is particularly the work of um, black refugee women and queer folks who from the perspective and the lived experiences that police does not entail a form from security lead the way to think about how security and safety could be even thought of in a realm or in, um, yeah, in networks that, that, that do not draw on the interpolation of the police states and other forms of policing. And I think um, engaging with various of these um, groups and especially on the intersection of these groups so really foster the solidarity between anti-prison and anti-police groups, migrant and refugee collectives, sex worker networks, Roma communities and feminist groups from the perspective of understanding policing as the condition of unbreathing would actually help to build a world where we can all breathe. Thank mm. you. So I just want to begin by thanking the panelists for four incredibly rich um, discussions that give us a lot to think and talk about. Before we open up to a broader discussion with everyone, I just wanted to pull out some uh, threads that came up in, in uh, the four uh, different presentations. So one place that, um, I'll throw out a few and then you all can pick on what you'd like to and, and I'm sure add other things. But one of the things that, that stood out for me in a powerful way, um, uh, apart from this question, where are you from diaspora, where are you from blackness, um, there was uh, multiple references uh, also to the middle passage. Um, thinking about, uh, again, this, this space, uh, you know, fantasies in the hold or however one wants to approach it. But I'm really thinking about the way that each of you uh, are approaching the question of policing, of abolition, raises a new way of thinking about the Middle Passage, again, from a, a transnational European uh, perspective. Um, I'm also quite taken with the way that so many of our panelists themselves are also creative writers. <laughs> and even if they're not writing creatively, the work that they're doing is about the creation of new language, right? New forms of recognition by challenging the police, challenging the law, new visions uh, and modes of relationality. So I'd be very curious to, to think more with you all aloud about the very specific kind of structural concerns that you all raise, and then the question about that creative work of creating life, right? New language, new visions, and new imaginaries. Um, there's so much to, to work with, but one other place, um, you know, that, that, that could be controversial, but I think that's great because we are here on a university campus, and that is, was raised both in the question of disciplines, where do these questions get studied? The question of discipline, as we know, is going to also raise the question of who is doing the actual work. I remind my students that when I got my PhD in, in literature, I was one of eight African Americans in the country to do so. It's not that long ago. So the disciplines, who's doing the work, the question of methodology, which methodologies are taken up. Centrally, we've heard the terms intersectionality, black feminisms with the plural, um, also uh, in that regard. And then the other uh, interesting uh, phrase was the methodological Eurocentrism, right? So even as we work within our disciplines and with the methodologies that we've been taught, in what ways do they themselves also reproduce Eurocentric ways of thinking and understanding the world? There's uh, one last thing about place. Um, uh, I'm thinking about place and knowledge production, again, in the reference to Frankfurt um, mm -hmm. and critical theory, thinking also about place and knowledge production like Birmingham in reference to Paul Gilroy, uh, spaces like the UC system, uh, how these conversations play out differently depending on where in the United States one is also situated, uh, and so on. So the place 
um, discipline question, the question of the creativity and challenging structural oppression, um, the role of <coughs> abolition in rethinking uh, imaginaries of the Middle Passage, uh, any of those that you all would like to take up or something else that you need to. Thanks. Oh, nine. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for that really synthetic and engaged response, Elise. Um, well, also, you know, my kingdom for anyone who would bring me a glass of water. Um, <laughs> not Robin Kelly. Oh, my God. Okay. Anyone else? It's fine. It's fine. We edit this out. Um, <laughs> I, I want to respond um, to, yeah, and I'm also just really looking forward to, I also wanted to be, sorry, uh, I'm stimulated by your, by your intervention, and I also want to say, um, yeah, more questions around um, black, uh, uh, so I can really tease out what I mean and like circle towards it, because for me it's really a reaching towards, because I'm thinking again about an orientation and an approach, for example, to the black Mediterranean. Um, and so, you know, it, interlocution, um, communication and really dialogue um, will, will help me approximate that. So I'm thinking about that because um, what I felt to say, I think, I've blacked out now, um, is uh, that the black Mediterranean for me is a political paradigm and an orientation. And for me, that's one that, because it's a life-making project, it's one that needs to transcend the discipline and the disciplinary. You know, it's, so it's not just yeah, it's, it's also everything that I say and everything that I think about these things is with an abiding understanding of, you know, where the material resources are or why we turn to certain forms of, uh, of knowledge production. And it's not like a critique of the people who turn to those things, but rather um, uh, uh, an offering, a request that we consider what it would mean to reorient. To, to reorient. Um, and in this, for me, the creative is, is this. And I think um, uh, about, for example, C.L.R. James, who talks about black studies uh, being uh, a response to, I'm gonna have nightmares about this, thank you so much. <laughs> it's like, I just chopped, chopped and Robin Kelly brought me water, like who am I? Um, it's fine. I respect you so much. Um, you know, that, that, that we think about the, the, the real project of black study um, as, as a, the critique of Western civilization, right? And so, I mean, what is Western civilization? And also, let's, let's peep this Euro-oriented room in which we're, we're sitting while on Gabrielino Tongva land, right? The West is all around us, it permeates, and we could be speaking only to each other, but here in this architectural space, here in the air we're breathing, here in this like pollute, right, we're, we're, we're in it. And so there's an in it, but not of it, but also a recognition that we're in it first. Um, and so for me, I, hope I'm not, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be over time, but um, for, for me uh, to, to really take that seriously and then say, well, if the West is everything, then what we need, um, and I talked with, yeah, Elizabeth Robinson, especially about this. Uh, George Lipsitz, Santa Barbara is also is one of those places, as you mentioned, um, with the legacy of Cedric Robinson, that um, we need a calculated response. And if we're really responding to the matter of black life, we cannot, I understand some of us have degrees and, um, and, and we need qualifications in certain places, but we cannot go to sociology purely. We actually cannot go through the anthropological. We cannot just go to the, the political scientific, I don't know how they all work, but we actually need to have, as the West permeates in every facet of life, we need a calculated and multi-pronged approach, and we need a collective response. Otherwise, the work we're doing um, is ultimately moot. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I agree. And there's, for, for me, um, I mean, there are a few different institutional and disciplinary strictures, I think, that, um, that are in operation at any given time when trying to do work, particularly work on black life generally, whether it's discrimination and marginalization in the workplace or deaths in policing situations. And when, I, when I'm teaching law, we have a few things that we have to cover <laughs> just because of what the students expect. Um, and what the, what the discipline requires for being able to become a lawyer. But I'm really privileged in the sense that my faculty allows us to take, to take experimental um, approaches. So I teach a course called Race, Law, and Literature, 
where we interrogate the incapacity of law to see certain things that you know writers actually can write about and they can express in a language. So we we teach, for example, um, uh, Zong by Nurupse Philip, and it's it's amazing because the students say, oh, okay, they took apart a legal judgment and created something else, but l let's interrogate the connections between those things. And for me, those types of experimental approaches are actually so much more formative for legal scholars because like I said before, legal scholars have to see the bigger picture to know what they're accountable for when they're going into a legal you know, battle because otherwise you're just a cog in a machine as opposed to having a strategy and having some vision of what you want it to do. Um, so I mean, that's part of the challenge that I'm having in writing this book on race cases in Europe because there's European law, which um, usually the law is translated to English, so everyone can at some point access um, the English version of the judgments, and most legal jurisdictions will have to interpret those anyway. But people can't see across jurisdictions if they're not reading the uh, lower court decisions in these different regions. So the discussions about how to address law amongst, let's say, black communities in different European countries can't get as specific as the local court jurisdictions. So the question of translation and doing work that's way beyond what's typically done in uh, legal teaching settings is required in order to bring social advocacy forward. So it's about translation work and thinking outside of the box that the discipline provides for you. Yeah, thank you, Felice, for this, um, for bringing them also, uh, yeah, really intersecting the questions It's um, and your thoughts. I think it's, it's super fruitful. Mm. Um, the question about the middle passage or abolition, I, in <coughs> thinking about the policing of blackness and struggles, I really, although I learned a lot from the U.S. context and being in conversation with abolitionists, um, activist groups, scholar activists like Ruth Wilson Gilmore, critical resistance, etc. I think it's still important to look at what are the local formations of these forms of, of abolitionism and um, to also put them in a, in, a, in, a, in a conversation in terms of their various genealogies. Um, and for me, obviously, Fanon is really helpful. Um, and I think that had something to do with like when I studied um, philosophy, um, in Frankfurt, I, I learned to, to turn to Fanon very often. So it was like you read Adorno and Horkheimer's um, Dialectic of Enlightenment, and it was Fanon, the wretched of the earth, that taught me how to do a radical black critique of the dialectic of enlightenment that led me to, is it a dialectic when it comes to, um, when it comes to black experiences and the condition of of anti-blackness as constitutive for a modern world formation, racial capitalism, um, etc. So it's it's really I think these transnational conversations are very important, but also to really appreciate and and draw and think with um, the various um, transnational um, yeah the, the transnational dimension of black radical thought. Um, and I think the question of creating life um, as I would say, um, yeah, as a black abolitionist, where it's not about just like um, getting rid of the police or getting, but to create new institutions of life, right? And um, so, and here I maybe think that there are also certain, when it comes to the critique of um, policing, prisons, etc., that especially in get in, with the engagement with the work that SA, for example, um, that they are doing on the black Mediterranean is crucial and others to think about and what these the groups we're working with are also doing to to really think well it's not just a national question right like a black radical critique of policing um, shows that secure or anti-blackness is the stuff out of which security is made of and this includes national security urban security border security and especially the aspect of border security I mean it's not an aspect aspect is really minimizing this the complex of border security is what we can currently like really need to interrogate and that of course then links to the question of citizenship um, so 
yeah, I'm, I'm maybe rambling a bit, but yeah. So um, for me, it's really about these transnational black radical conversations of abolitionism. Um, I had a question. Um, so they were also speaking across and to each other, Eddie. Um, yeah, because obviously the legal question, I find it um, basically, I'm just going to circle back and reiterate, like, Felice's question for me was actually really great, and I wonder, um, as you're teaching on race, literature, and the law, how do you, and this is in a law school, as you said, take the question of the law, um, do, you, do you think of it in relation to literature? And I say this as, I mean, my PhD is in history of consciousness, so that's why I don't have feelings about disciplines that are super positive, <laughs> but um, I'm also really wondering, uh, the, the law is, a, you know, it's a genre, like, like, like so many other things, and um, is there any space um, for your students? As of course, again, they need to be qualified in certain things to take the question of the law, some of which is not even written. I know in the UK constitutionally, so there's there are different ways that the law is sort of laid out and remade, rearticulated, reiterated. That I think of like, like in terms of like patchwork poetry. All right, like I've said this, and therefore you can say this, and we're just speaking um, on layers, and you're talking about it from lower court to mm. supreme or superior courts, mm -hmm. but um, really if it's, if it's a living genre and document, could certainly not something else be written that would just take the whole thing away? And is this possible to tell your students about? Like, good luck being lawyers, but also, <laughs> Like an ab maybe an abolitionist orientation to the genre of the law mm. as a literary document, right? Because it all is a fiction, as right? Like right, if you say Proposition 209 and says, you know, what it prohibits in terms of people studying and being able to make not like it, we're not take we're not thinking about gender or race or this or that as though again we're not always already thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. There is a fi it's a fiction, no? Yeah. It's a literary genre in a way. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, actually, and this is going to lead to a question for, for Fuad as well, we'll in terms of this, uh, this idea of the digital, digital um, what is it called, digital studies or digital humanities. Part of, part of what I think is challenging for me teaching the course is there, is, there are a lot of ways to, um, to think across law and literature. And, and within law and literature, there are a few movements as well. There's law as literature, so reading the law as though it were mm -hmm. literature and reading literarily. Um, and then there's looking for uh, literary processes within law or identifying ways in which uh, there's like a creative type of, of use of some ideology within law. And all of these are interesting for, I think, for teaching material, it is almost like teaching, on one hand, the body of law that we're looking at is kind of like a fiction set by institutions just like any other institutions with its own vicissitudes and expectations vernaculars. On another hand, it's, it's almost like um, coding and decoding and translating and working with kind of what's between the lines and trying to exercise the ability of reading something into or something in a document that's there but it's not there on its mm -hmm. surface so zong is one um one example of that another example is what i'm doing with um with the archival documents i'm looking at when doing this indenture research so mm -hmm. a lot of writing about indenture is about death so you know death and, and similar with with slavery although there are a lot more documents to work with um, that are accessible you're reading about mortality rates on ships. You're reading about mortality rates and uh, causes of death in, um, on plantations from Jamaican uh, colonial, off the Jamaican colonial office. But you're not getting the full story about state violence. So you're having to do creative work to try, try to reveal the interior lives of these people. So um, Catherine McKittrick and Sadia Hartman um, have done work like this. And I think this is a mode of doing law, actually, mm -hmm. because um, it's, it's understanding what's not on the page and what you have to actually work, not to uncover, but to co-create and kind of imagine. Um, and sorry, last point on this. It's another Toni Morrison reference. Yeah. Um, in sites of, memory, sites of Memory, where she says it's more important for her to move from 
uh, the image to the text than from the text to the image. Because if you start from the image that you know is closer to some resemblance of the truth, and then you can write about that image, that's more um, important to her than creating a text around vocabulary that exists to create an image that might not be as close to the truth as you're imagining that image could be. So I guess it's the creative power that it, it enables us to kind of be the authors of our history and then to figure out how that maps onto institutions rather than vice versa. Yeah, thank you. So we have about 23 minutes or so for discussion. Should we open up for questions from the rest of the oh, Please, please, please. Um, I just wanted to add uh, <coughs> two um, important points concerning institution institutionalization of black studies in Germany. Mm -hmm. Last year I was um, participating in a network um, symposium about black studies in Germany and how to implement that. It was organized by Each One Teach One and Each One Teach One is a black organization based in Berlin. And they're doing a lot of work for the black communities um, within Ger uh, Germany but also specifically Berlin. What um, the discussion was about um, the, problem, the problem about um, black historiography within Germany and also within the European countries that it's not acknowledged. When it comes from the, um, hu um, the humanities, it depends on, it doesn't matter if it's anthropology, ethnology, philosophy, all those fields who deals with um, kind of form of cultural um, knowledge production and social knowledge production, it always lacks with a uh, perspective for marginalized um, people. And um, that's the epistemological framework where it comes to the also kind of policing but in an epistemological way, when if you erase people, then you don't have um, the necessity or the interest in um, learning their histories or knowing about their bodies and what has happened in the past and also in the present. Um, what is also important in that context is um, the German uh, colonial memory politics because um, there is a big memory politics concerning uh, the Holocaust and what has happened after um, the Second World War and during, this, uh, during all that um, pro um, problematic um, kind of genocide, what has happened to, to, towards Jewish people, but there is no linkage to the colonial past in Namibia. And there is no colonial, there is no um, linkage about um, what has happened in Namibia, and that there the first uh, concentration camps um, was established there. So um, that the erasure of black realities and black stru struggles started in um, the erasure in terms of the memory politics in Germany, mm -hmm. and um, that is linked to the. Um, history and it is linked to how um, humanities is working and also how politics is uh, continuing right now. And there is a black movement in Berlin, they're doing, for example, lobby work because there is this problem of um, counting people. They don't want to count the um, black people in Germany um, or even some any marginalized group because they, it is linked to problematic um, history, but it is um, the black community in Berlin is fighting for uh, numbers to um, show the structural discrimination within workplace and um, policing and everything. Mm. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Mm. <coughs> um, yeah. yeah. My notes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Are there questions from the audience? Is, should we take a mic around for the recording? Yes, well that has been us, and now here we are. Um, there's a mic on that bag there. Thank you so much, Dr. Mendez, for offering us this. It's on this side. Thank you to all of you for um, these very interesting presentations. I have a question for Vanessa. I'm, interesting, I'm interested in understanding why you chose these three spaces, which I find very interesting since they have very different colonial histories. Um, going back to the idea of the Middle Passage, how colonialism actually and historic um, research has showed how colonial legacies has shaped 
state and policing in Europe also, so maybe think of that as also something that is impactful, maybe in another way, um, the middle passage uh, epistemology. And, um, and yeah, so why these three spaces? Um, and are you engaging more in a comparative or a transnational understanding of how policing and blackness functions? Um, yeah, I, I'm just very interested in knowing more. Yeah, thank you. That's an important question, especially. So I'm not too much into this comparative framework because it really reproduces methodological nationalism. So I'd rather like talk about relational, transnational. Like for me, the comparative is still rooted in like a form of the nation, and then it, there you do a comparison. You know, for me, it's about following also um, the materiality of unbreathing and the struggles against it. So that maybe links to the first question because a lot of now first these three um, the white innocence and colonial amnesia in these three countries is very very different. At the same time, it was in the mid 2000s that the issue of racial profiling, majorly by activist groups, was brought to the forefront, and that was also direct, also in conversation. Like for example, the group. I'm now like engaging with Alliance Against Racial Profiling, have context to a lot of the groups working in Germany. So it's actually about following and engaging and deeply um, being committed to the activist linkages and organizational linkages, right? So I think sometimes it's also important to think of when we think about the question like why do we choose a context, it's sometimes like even, oh, because there's a certain research question or there's a certain, and what would it mean to turn that question around and think, okay, what would it mean to, str to start the question from, or to start the engagement from the, the movements of struggle. Um, that does not mean that I would like to in some way center these contexts. What is for me interesting in all of these three contexts, and I've been working with black uh, movements in France now since 2010, policing was a major issue of course um, there too, like founding groups in Germany and then there was also this cross cut, organizing together, etc. To like say, okay, those are contexts I know and engage with politically. So for me, even being in Germany, you know, this is not just a US issue to say like, okay, I see something's going on in, in Portugal. I'm not really, I engage with people who do that struggle in Portugal and the activist circles I'm engaging with, we try to have these meetings, etc. But that doesn't give me the authority as a researcher then to say, okay, going to Portugal now. You know, I think it's really like necessary, especially in terms of the language issue where we also talked about um, um, yesterday in, in European context to say like, okay, how can we also prevent, although we're activist scholars, um, to step into some sort of colonial anthropology in our, um, in our like dedicated uh, research activism. Middle passage is for me not the central framework. Like when I go to, it's a very important one, I, I very much think the conversation is very necessary, but when I turn to Fanon in terms of the condition of combat breathing, he was looking at colonialism when he tried to grasp and understand the <coughs> nexus of policing and militarization. And I think that's very important. He, he does that in The Wretched of the Earth, but also in A Dying Colonialism, where he shows that um, actually the police and the military are the same in the colony. Now that even shows us something for today when we talk about the militarization of the police in the centers of the global north. And you're thinking like, what would it mean to take Fanon here seriously? To really say like, this, this clear cut can actually not even be made in that way. So for me, it's really about to bring also these frameworks in conversation because the Middle Passage, although the Black Mediterranean may be, I think, draws on that, but at the same time really like brings very Im important formations even in, into conversation. Same with the conversation between the middle passage and forms of colonialism on the African continent and beyond. How do you see the teaching style translating into some kind of radical lawyer, lawyering in practice? Because you're still entering these spaces. 
And I'm interested in the kind of strategy that goes into reading the law in a way that works for folks. Um, and, and the question from Vanessa has to do with, um, I noticed there was a mention of transformative justice. If you could talk a little bit about what constitutes a transformative justice uh, practice in the spaces you're engaged in. Um, I'll just say a few words. I think uh, a lot of, I think some people think of radical lawyering as just strategic litigation or picking the right cases and doing the right cases. And of course, that's not really radical. It's just using the law in one of various ways that it's meant to be used. Um, but then I guess the teaching legal theory in a way that gets us to question um, the formation of the of, of, of state, um, you know, state formation more generally, or to, to think about how the law is invested in certain uh, power structures, including racial capitalism, uh, and to think of policing as one of various ways in which the law, I mean, it's, it's the law's enforcement mechanism. Um, those types of questions, to raise them with students of law, is, are, are really important for how they might then shape the students activities outside of a legal forum that help to help them to make decisions about like I don't know a, a better way to frame it than account of accountability what they're accountable for when they make those choices of what kind of law to pursue or what to defend or what kind of legal changes to bring about but I think teaching the limits of what that can do is also really important. Um, so I think one of the pitfalls that people have when they invest a lot of time in thinking that law is a vehicle for social change is to think that it's either the outcome that you're looking for is a legal one or that it's the vehicle that you go to first and then you figure out how to change society with that vehicle rather than it being an institution that's constantly in conversation with um, community organizing and broader visions of, of social change. So the strategies that we use at Birkbeck are to try to teach that sensibility about law's limits and, and limitations and racisms, for example, or sexism um, in the core curriculum, not just in classes that are dedicated to, you know, like not just my race law literature class, but I have a um, colleague named Sarah Keenan who does really amazing work in property law um, and she teaches it in the core class, so you can't graduate without having a class with her, and it's going to be kind of dismantling the idea of property from a colonial perspective, um, uh, or using a colonial critique of it. So, um, so if I think training lawyers in that critical vein is the first step, but I, I do think that we're limited in what we can do because it's not a radical institution. Um, so I think it's about teaching that it's not a radical institution, <laughs> ultimately. Yeah, thank you for that question, um, Sources. So it's mainly um, groups, at least in the German context, groups which are already um, articulating their lived experiences from the intersection. So mainly um, black women and um, women of color, black queer folks, um, queers of color, like les migras, femigras, women in exile, who in various, either the anti-violence work or the women organizing in detention centers or in, um, what's, what's, uh, Laga? Camps. Yeah, in camps, who, where this is actually really coming from, I would say, in the, in the, at least in the German context, you know, and as a form of community accountability and as a form of looking out for each other. So now even anti-policing groups like one group I'm very active with, um, Copwatch, we try to understand we are looking out for each other. And at the one hand to say, okay, when you are targeted by police, um, show up. Show up for the person that was racially profiled. Like, um, uh, be accountable in, in offering your being a witness. 
because very often this is what actually happens when it comes to policing, that people would say, well, I was just the only one, of, and all the people were just passing by and nothing happened. So this form, but also looking out for each other in a more deeper sense, to really say, like, okay, what happens in cases of domestic violence, sexualized violence, in the, in the lagas then, in the camps, to say, like, okay, to really engage with a practice that is based on looking out for each other without interpolating the security and carceral state. Um, and that's, that has different forms in, in terms of the practices because the work is so, transformative justice work is so, uh, how can I say, is it contingent that, or is it like, there's, there's not one recipe because it's mainly about um, interrogating the individualization of violence. So what does it then mean to bring a community or to call upon a community to show up for each other, right? And, and then to elaborate with the community what is needed now. Sorry, it, uh, are there other questions? We have about five minutes <coughs> left for Q&A, so if other people have questions, we could get them all out, and then I'll let the panelists respond to, to everything at once. Is there any other question from the floor? I'll jump in at once. I'll just make this as simple as possible. I've heard um, people, it's kind of been implied, digital technology over the last couple of days. And if someone could just speak specifically to um, the implications for new forms of policing, blackness, data bodies, um, that's just wrap it in somehow. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, um, I, my question was around this sort of um, version of the Violence Against Women's Act, um, not here, but actually, um, so, so how that context has been, this newer version, um, and, uh, and I'm wondering if that plays a role in sort of thinking through um, policing and that relationship between militarization aspects and policing as militarization, and, um, and I heard so much, I think, in, in the conversation also about sort of Safety as, as, as almost necessary as well as evolution in many ways. Um, and so, um, not that I'm advocating for 
and safe spaces. Um, but and so I was just wondering, um, I'd love to hear more about that. And from the actually, this question is maybe from the next slide. Are you gonna? Sorry. And so we see Dr. Mendez, the, the negotiation of building community uh, and really seeing what it is that the community needs, how we respond in real time. Um, so I, yeah, we'll take the first question and then give um, folks some time to respond specifically to their, um, to their areas of focus. Although, of course, yes, thank you so much, Professor Merrill, because this is a question for all of us. Um, what I think, um, how I would respond to that question, and again, I make a turn, um, a resistive turn, an and almost antagonistic turn, but, you know, in a delicate sort of way um, to make it more palatable for some, uh, against the, the question of, um, of comparison. I also say, gosh, and it is recorded. Um, thank you so much, Paul, back there. But, you know, I actually, um, well, I'll make a turn because what I want to do then, especially as we segue into our fantastic keynote, you know, it is on the matter of blackness in Europe. And so another word, very briefly, though, on um, our, well, at least my understanding in conversation with my co-organizer, Vanessa, about why. And this is specifically because it's not Black Lives Matter. It's not Black Lives Matter Europe. Um, it is specifically on black life mattering. And we mean by this, the material, the psychological, the very structural conditions of what it means to mean and make black life and living and thriving possible in this place we're referring to as Europe. And so, why I make this resistance to comparison, while I make this resistance com to comparison, I again read the quote from yesterday um, from Cedric Robinson's Black Marxism, which I just encourage everyone to read. Um, 1983, again in 2000, there's so many European, you know, we were talking to Vecker and others about Stuart Hall, Hazel Carby, so many thinkers from the European context or informed by European colonial and imperialism. But, as Robin D.G. Kelly comments, again, I just am quoting myself and via quoting him, um, Robinson continued the early legacy of diaspora studies, but also continued, uh, also developed a conception of the black Mediterranean as a precondition to the black Atlantic and the making of Europe itself. And so by this, I mean, I would respond and I have responded to students, some of whom are in the room in terms of why, how can I make this mean? How can I make this matter? Is to really say, well, you know, the US, which is also a settler colonial space and territory, is in a way very much shaped um, in, with, and beyond um, the European context with Europe, right? And so when people are talking about the Middle Passage, I also take um, Vanessa's, I'll name it as resistance, but you know, the ships came from somewhere, hey? Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about this and we're saying, you know, uh, in the European context, in multiple languages, well, race, what an American problem, when without, without you, there would be no race, right? Without you, there would be no system of racialized capital. You really made that structure, and what Sajin, why I turned to Cedric Robinson, even though, again, so many other scholars and forms and within Europe, is because his conceptualization in Four Jews of Memory, great text, not just black Marxism, which in his passing gets recited and cited, but I'm not sure if it's read, um, is that he speaks about racial regimes and the revelation of hiding the regime of race is primarily the project of Europe. So they export race, they put it on the boat, they send it here, and now we're proliferating these discourses and the racism comes from here. So it's not 100 years or two or three or four, it's actually millennia. And so I don't mean anything cute or even, you know, yeah, it's not a couplet. I'm a here doing, but really to say that actually um, what is distinctive about black Europe is that it cannot be thought um, independently and the black Atlantic, black life in the US cannot be thought without it. In fact, it's not being thought without it, but via a racial regime, mm. we're obscuring it in the day to day by thinking Black Lives Matter comes from here only. Mm. Yeah, I'm not even going to try to uh, follow that. but. To add to it, like there's there's a really real sense in which we carry these stories with us as well, and in in different ways. I mean, my story is different from other people's stories, but um, in finding out who we are, we're also finding out what the histories are, and these histories are also European histories when they're in the in the U.S. So, you know, finding out my I'm the I'm the family archivist, and that picture of my grandma, I was doing the research on her family, and her family was owned by French Huguenots who 
you know, who fled uh, Europe but then owned slaves in, in South Carolina. And that story is, a, it's a continuous story. It's one that, it's an unbroken story. And so I guess the idea of it being relational as opposed to compar comparative is really important. Um, and I, I, I'm also thinking the ways in which the, the policing technologies, and I, I, maybe this speaks to your question about policing and data and new technologies around policing, are shared ones with a shared vocabulary, but also shared technology in terms of data science and in terms of policing, uh, police that are trained in other parts of the world from the U.S. who are trained in Israel or who, who um, what, like, or G4S, which is kind of a globalizing um, outsourced policing outfit uh, that has tactics and frames of thinking about difference in criminalizing uh, black people in particular that are shared amongst um, different, you know, different governmental regimes. So it is a continuous story, and while we are talking about the, the differences um, amongst them, the, the commonalities amongst them are also very strong, and we carry them with us. Um, yeah. um, exactly, and what I wanted to add um, concerning why uh, is Black Europe so um, relevant, your question, um, is because also um, the, the racial um, regime started there in the philosophical context when the racial, rationalization of racism um, came from German and English philosophers mm -hmm. who started, as you said, as you referenced it, to, um, to how um, to how this kind of um, racialization and also how it materialized not today in everyday politics. For example, I um, translate in the um, Federal Office for Migration and Refugees. That means um, I, th this kind of, I refer this kind of documents and these, um, how people from uh, Somalia, for, um, specifically people from Somalia, are being interrogated. Why are they there, for example? Why do they come from? Um, and and re, to be re-traumatized, is, this, is, this institution is so powerful and subjugating towards black bodies in, in, in so far that they also um, um, rationalize and also they try to justify this interrogation as something that is lawful. And then we should rethink what does it mean when it comes to the idea of legal or illegal, because this is something that materializes in, in realities. When people, for example, when I translate for the, for the refugees, it's, it happens like that. I, I go some uh, in the morning to the, to the, to the office, and then um, there are people waiting, and they don't know when they are going to be interrogated, they don't know what is going to happen, they don't know anything. T sometimes it happens that um, the people don't um, get, in um, get that, um, the questions or they, they are not allowed to even speak or to, uh, to voice their opinion. And even that I am there for tr translating for them, I'm not translating for the German government. I'm translating for the people who are coming and to voice their realities because I don't think that I have to be allied uh, to have an allyship with the German government in, a, in this way mm -hmm. and but the problem here is that they um, don't see me without th that they see me as a, also a form of re representative from the German government because I'm working there so this is a, an ambivalent situ situation where solidarity is, um, has to be negotiated within the translation so that they realize that I am not there um, to, for the German government. Specifically, it's arbitrary how they, um, how they deal with the people, especially, specifically black Muslim women, because they say when they want to take pictures, they say, you have to put a, uh, off your scarf. And then I, I know that this is not lawful. And then I say, why? Because then I, um, then, then I know the, the law and I know how to interrogate, 
how to um, interrogate and to say, um, why are you doing that? And the last time when I did that, then the woman was um, was able to wear her scarf because there were no justification. First, they want to argue with me, but when I ask why, and I know the law, and when, and then they knew that they cannot police this uh, situation in the way that they want because someone was there to uh, who was informed. So information is really um, key, and they don't tell the people that um, a lawyer, for example, is important for their. Um, <coughs> For their case, this is something that they ask. They specifically say to them, "You, you do, um, you, you have the right to get a lawyer, but it's it's not that important." That is what they say, and then the the people who um, are asylum seekers, they think it is not really important. And then I say to them, "You cannot sit here without a lawyer." And every time I translated for someone, they were sitting there with without a lawyer, mm -hmm. and this is. This is the state of art right now in, in, in the German institution. Yeah, and maybe oh, yeah. Um, very briefly on the question of policing and militarization. I think it's really um, important of ter in terms of having a global transnational abolitionist perspective. Um, because very often, I mean, I don't want to say very often, because of a, lo a lot of, especially like feminism that is rooted in, intersection, in, in intersectionality is doing the work already, like drawing on the intersectings of how policing and carcerality inwards is linked to militarization, securitization of border war politics, global war politics, geopolitics, in the external sense. And I think that's where... Um, a transnational conversation and a global conversation in the spirit of abolition is really, um, yeah, it's just crucial. And it comes then, of course, from these intersectional perspectives, you know, like women um, in the global south, queer folks in the global south under the threat of militarization and how this is bound to empire and to the responses of empire inwards in, term, in terms of policing, carcerality, etc. To really see this in a more, and there we go again with, in a sort of way how important it is to interrogate uh, methodological nationalism, also in, t in terms of the war on terror. You know, I, I think it's just so, like, what would it mean? And I just came from a, um, a, a conference on, on abolition where there was so much, like, fruitful conversation about this to really see, like, how can we bring this in abolitionist conversations? And I think it really starts with a black and transnational feminism. And that's, unfortunately, she's not here uh, today, but Margot Okazawa Ray was here, who is just such an inspiration in linking um, also these struggles, especially against militarization and criminalization. Well, this has been an extraordinary panel. Um, I'm so thankful for all of your time and attention. We're going to stop now, but let's take just a 10 minute break instead of 15, and then we'll resume for the keynote at 3.40. Before you go, let's thank our panelists. <laughs>